we should go back a bit and remember why the cloud became what it is today. They kind of acknowledge that these things happen. Anybody has a bad day, we globally hear about that. Get to it, do it fast. Right here. On the Innycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here. On the Innycast. What the hell's the cloud? I, like, <laughs> I didn't know for a long time, then I thought I knew, now I don't know again. Uh, when you talk cloud, what, what are you talking about? I'm talking about what the client's talking about, right? So I'm leading them. The cloud mm. means many things to many people. Um, I think as a general term, a, a cloud infrastructure is just, a, it's, it's more of a, a, an operational expenditure as opposed to a capital expenditure. It's just a way to put things into an environment where you're just spending on them differently and using them differently. And that could have many examples. So I really let the client drive what they feel the cloud is to their organization, right? Because you have public cloud, which are the big three, you know, AWS, GCP, Azure, you have private cloud or bare metal, right? There's a lot of things. You have UCAS, people look at UCAS as a cloud platform because you're taking your on-prem mm -hmm. telephone system and putting it into something that doesn't exist necessarily on site. So, you know, again, there's so many different variations, but I think the general definition is really just, you know, a way to uh, use uh, uh, an environment that's hopefully constantly updated and sitting there out off-prem in a meaningful way to your business. Got it. So with that in mind, you know, with, with a broad definition of cloud, it, it, it can and cannot and does and doesn't work across a variety of, of opportunities for a variety of different people. You know, what I, what I see today is a ton of now declouding or a little bit of cloud backlash because, um, you know, people that thought it was, it was the answer might've just been asking the wrong question. Um, <laughs> Not not to date. We try not to. I try not to talk about current events on anything. But you know, LinkedIn, owned by Microsoft, announces you know inability to move to Azure um, after three years of trying is an interesting um, case study and probably a few different things. Uh, and one of which is sometimes the cloud is not the answer, even when it seems like it should, would, could be. Um, how do you see, like, are there any definite waving green flags for you when people want to talk cloud or definite waving red flags? A absolutely. So I think, I think we should go back a bit and remember why the cloud became what it is today. Uh, and when I say, when I'm talking about public, you know, public cloud, I use Barnes and Noble as this example, because it's a great example. Um, you talk about an organization, you know, way back when that had a huge, uh, climb in business around the holidays. And I remember having them as a client many years ago. They would buy infrastructure, millions and millions of dollars worth of servers to sit in their data centers to be used a month and a half, maybe two months a year. And if you think about that, right, over three years, that hardware becomes old and it becomes dated and, you know, you, potential, potential for issues. And at this point, you've used that hardware for about six months. Right, so the use case of having the public cloud to create this bursty seasonal play was the to me one of the biggest original use cases of of this. Right, and it made sense. You know, if you have applications that need to have high and low seasons, spin it up when you need it, and spin it down when you don't. Um, but it's become something bigger than that, and it's become this thing where uh, everything needs to be in it in order to function, which is not the case. Right, hybrid has existed just as long as the cloud, and more importantly, it's. Um, it's a lot more efficient, both technically and economically. So when you go all cloud, if your applications, applications don't fit snug, you're going to find yourself grossly overpaying for ingress and egress traffic, which is a massive cost these days. And you're going to be paying for high compute that you may or may not need. It depends, right? And then you have a lot of applications that shouldn't be in the cloud because while there's probably ways to put them in the cloud, they're just not there yet, whether it's an Oracle instance or um, uh, Unix, right? There's a lot of still, you know, mainframe, there's still a lot of these applications that are still immature as it relates. Uh, they're quickly coming up with solutions, but even though those solutions exist today, they're still not where they need to be in order to be as efficient as having something on-prem. Sure. And so that those sound like the, the red flaggy ones. Is there, uh, the green flag was seasonal. Um, 
vertically, is there anything that jumps out at you as like cloud is going to fit 99% of the time or, or is that trying to, is that back to, to forcing people to into the cloud because they were told to buy from cloud because cloud, like the, the usual answer I get for cloud is because cloud. Uh, yeah, well, you have to realize who, who's making the decision, right? If you have a guy who wants to be on the forefront of technology or a girl that's sitting in this organization, it's not coming out of their pocket, right? Their, their personal checking is not being emptied out because of the cost of AWS. They just want to be in it. It's easier. There's lots of tools, lots of functionality. Um, so that's that's a big driver of this. That actually sounds like a pretty good outcome from hiring consultants. Like, I think I would be happy to to actually hire someone and that be the result. It's yes. like completely non-intuitive. Right. Uh, you wouldn't have just guessed it. You probably wouldn't even have found that just asking a person because they don't know. Right. I think my favorite thing about any kind of human is how bad they are at telling you what their problem actually is. Mm. And that sounds like, yeah, it's like, why are you mad? Because my bags took too long. It's like, well, no. <laughs> they, they were way faster than the last one you were happy with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. I think about that story a lot uh, when it comes to <laughs> performance and, and yes. again, perception of, of speed. I heard, a, I heard a similar thing for um, one of the companies that did on-demand online printing. So you'd like go design your business cards or whatever and click around and then ask to get this thing printed. There was this correlation between people feeling like something was hard and you making it actually look difficult that they found where, where if you click like design my business card and you get the response like instantaneously, it actually weirds you out a little bit because you expect some stuff to be happening in the background. Yes. But if you, if you get an artificial like loading thing for a, the right amount of time, not like 40 seconds, but like three seconds, you're like, Oh cool. That was, that was valuable. Yeah. Um, which I've always found was really fascinating. I feel like I see those all the time on like social media, um, I don't want to call them scams, but social media, yes. uh, you know, personal improvement things or whatever. It's like, so we're building your custom dating plan. Stand right. by. Yeah. Right. And it's like loading yeah. over oh, 20% done. We haven't fully calculated your custom dating plan yet. Uh, right. But while you're yeah. waiting, would you like to upgrade to the super duper tier? It, yeah. It all comes down to almost like you're, you, what you're trying to do is not, you're trying to do things the way people expect them to happen, not actually increased performance and so right. like when i click a button in a number of increments i expect that to be instantaneous right but um it's not increasing performance it's like adapting to people's expectations and making making things not a surprising you know not surprising is there something in developer world and and fly that you've had to do that like does does something work too well or not the way people expect it and you guys had to refactor it oh yeah actually really early on um, actually there were a couple, I've run into this, I run into this with developers all the time. So when we first launched the kind of the current iteration, the good part of the product, the one that seems to be working, not any of the previous like disasters, uh, we, you, what we did was we had you basically run fly deploy and your, your, your app would get bundled up into a container. It would get put in a city closest to you. And then we just put it where it needed to go based on magic. And, um, what happened is devs were like, so I hit fly deploy, now what? And so you tell them all this good stuff just happened. And they're like, they don't feel it. It was interesting. They're like, mm. they kind of acknowledge that these things happen, acknowledge that it's pretty good, but they're left very unsatisfied as far as I can tell. And so we ended up changing, and even if you go to the homepage, you'll see this. We now tell people to run fly deploy, and then we tell them to add a region like Sydney or whatever. Because that like that second step that I didn't think was necessary it like scratch that itch for people because fly like like if you deploy a Rails app and you want to run it in Sydney, people acknowledge this is hard. If we give them a command that makes this happen, that makes it seem easier, they seem to really, really get did it. If we just automatically ran in Sydney, they were like completely unsatisfied with what we were doing. Right. If they're like, we geo detected like your location and picked the the node closest to yeah. you, and now it's live. A lot of what's going on in you know, web two versus web three is this notion of like centralization of the internet versus decentralization of the internet. Yeah. And that's occurring at many, many layers, right? Like we have the big, you know, the big cloud providers. You could argue that's a centralization of the internet. Well, the the consolidation of, you know, ISPs in New Hampshire is another sort of dimension of centralization of the internet. Um you know, something that 
I, I really sort of push and pull with this topic and I can, I, I can get from a, from a stance standpoint, I can see it from both sides, but just look at what goes on with the major recursive DNS players that are out there, mm. um, you know, in the internet. I mean, that is a centralization strategy around the DNS, the, the recursive layer of the DNS system that was intended to be highly, highly, highly decentralized. Now, comparatively speaking, like who runs a better recursive DNS service? Like me well, and my Raspberry Pi or somebody who does it every day? I don't know. That's an interesting, I hadn't thought about it. Like if you, if you actually group all of the things together, it's actually quite an interesting situation. If you just stick with like the number of eyeball subscribers, let's say for Comcast, uh, you know, Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, Cox, Charter. Yeah. Uh, then say Google DNS, OpenDNS, uh, Quad9, and Cloudflare. Right. Uh, and just say AWS US East 1. Yeah, sure. Sure. Like, uh, th yeah. Th like what is the what number, is the the number of around that? Exactly. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. It's big. It's a lot. It's big. It's big. Yeah. Right. Is I that, mean, so, I mean, we, we know that that is true, right? When, when anybody along that value chain, right? From the, the cloud provider to the DNS providers to the access providers, like when anybody has a bad day, like we globally hear about that and it's like their experience is the internet is dead, right. right? It's not like we had a pocket of a problem somewhere in the network like we used to. No, it's like the internet is down. Yeah. You're not the type of company that's putting in a cloud governance plan that's going to keep things stable and pristine, right? And that's another mm -hmm. big issue that we could talk about at some point is all these companies aren't putting in the proper cloud governance. So uh, a lot of the overspending beyond that ingress, ingress, exacerbation is is in the fact that they're not controlling who buys and how they buy or or instances that are running that yeah. shouldn't be running well, well talk about that because that's that's something that again as, as somebody who doesn't do a whole lot in the cloud that's not something i think about um you know i'm the guy who says why is this aws charged like a zillion dollars <laughs> on the credit card and how did this happen yeah well you have it on a credit card they have bills that are 70 or 80 or 100 pages long that make absolutely no sense so imagine getting like an – remember the old school um, MCI bills like you get when you had a, a wall mm -hmm. phone in a, in a business, not even in um, your home. So you can imagine what those bills look like. Now multiply that times a 1,000. That's what these cloud bills look like. Hard to disseminate. But you have a situation where a lot of these large organizations could have anywhere between 50 and 500 people buying off of uh, AWS or – Google and and there's no real communication or parameters around how they buy. And again, we're talking about people that don't own budgets. It's not coming out of their personal checking account. So if an instance stays up for an extra two and a half months, why do they care? And so I think, you know, my word of advice is is cloud governance, no matter how small of an organization you are, is an important thing to important process. To document because it'll mm. really, if you are going to use the cloud, it'll it'll minimize the overspending, um, and hopefully put you in a good place. Brought to you by Cashfly.